Hey world, Dan Brown here. Welcome to the first ever pilot episode of this as of yet unnamed Elder Dragon Highlander Magic the Gathering Commander related uh, thing. Pod podcast, I think is what we'll call it. A YouTube <laughs> podcast something. Uh, I'm here with a couple of my friends. You may have heard uh, Garrett a second ago. How's it going, Garrett? Uh, I'm Garrett and uh, <laughs> this is... And I'm Tao. And what we're going to do is we're going to play a game of Commander. We're not going to record it, mind you. Um, but we are going to take copious notes as we play. And then uh, once it's done, we're going to come back to you. And we're going to walk you through kind of turn by turn how the game progressed. And I, I think it's going to be really cool because I think that, you know, we're, we will, as we're recording that, learn things about what our opponents were thinking. And the audience, you guys, uh, will get to sort of learn along with us. Um, but before we do that, we should probably introduce our commanders, explain what an optimal game looks like with them, and Garrett, why don't, why don't you go first? Who, who are you playing, and what does right. a good game look like? So, uh, I'm playing Savala, Explorer Return, so does Tap. Each it's player... time to parlay. Yeah, 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 that's every, what it is. Every time. <laughs> every time. <laughs> yeah. um, so, each player <laughs> reveals a top card of his or library. Uh, for each non-land card revealed this way, add a green mana to your mana pool, and you gain a life, um, and then each player draws the card. Because the deck that I'm playing is an Enchantress build, um, I use it as a fake Enchantress to draw an extra card if I really, really come into a pinch. Honestly, if they made an Enchantress just general, I would play that in okay. general. Like, I, but uh, you know, I just have this is the closest thing I could find. It's just so. in the right colors, and <laughs> yes. sometimes it has additional value. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, cool. um, and uh, the optimal game, because like you said before, um, would just be to not be able to see the table underneath my board with so many enchantresses or enchantments, rather. Um, yeah. And specifically, the, what the enchantresses do is they draw you a exactly. card every time. Yeah, so you're so casting enchantments, so. drawing cards, casting more enchantments, drawing cards. Kind of like a permanent storm. Cool. Yeah. And we also have Tao. How's it going, Tao? Really well. Uh, I'm going to be playing a, a Horde of Notions deck, a five-color deck. So Horde of Notions for white, blue, black, red, green. You get a 5-5 five, five <laughs> elemental with a Vigilance Trample in Haste. That's pretty good. And uh, it has an activated ability for, for Wooberg. You, you can play an elemental card from your graveyard without paying its mana cost. And so out of all the five-color commanders that you could have gone with, why did you go with Horde of Notions? Did you cast Horde of Notions? Well, rarely I cast Heart <laughs> of Notions. Uh, the deck actually came about because I had uh, I had a Sadisi deck, a Sadisi Brew Tyrant deck, and a Caradar Ghost Chieftain deck that were really doing the same things. Mm -hmm. And I decided, what, let's just merge them together into one five color, splash a little red there. Okay. So uh, I was going to say, there's not much red between the two of them. No, no. But uh, <laughs> optimally, uh, you're going to see me play uh, a bunch of value creatures early game. Um, try to fill up my graveyard uh, in preparation for a big living death or a spire spawning and uh, hopefully that hits into sack outlets and blood artists to drain the rest of the table out it sounds really cool um so that means i'm the only one who has a commander that i've actually built around <laughs> uh i'm playing zada hedron grinder i did a deck tech on this channel um about pretty much this deck just like last week i, I have actually swapped out about eight cards i think which is a pretty big change um but it, it's pretty much all in combo what zada does is she's a four drop she has a three three body she's a goblin ally she was just printed in battle for zendikar um and whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell that targets only zada um copy that spell for each creature you control that it could target each one copies a different one so basically what we're doing in an ideal game is we're flooding the board with you know little mana dorks uh, lots, tokens, of, right? lots of little tokens yeah we're casting uh attempt with vengeance and getting our opponents to fall for you know giving us 20 elementals uh and then we cast they just printed expedite is a little cantrip it just says target creature gains haste and draw a card so every little instant or sorcery cantrip that says draw a card basically draws us a card for every creature we control and in um, the right sort of game, we're going to have one super explosive turn where we generate a bunch of mana from some sort of red ritual effect and then draw half of our library and then still have a bunch of mana left over and then ultimately combo out and swing with infinite creatures. Um, so we're going to try to do that right about now, I think. Do you have anything Sounds else to add? Good. Any questions? Uh, well, Comments? Do you, do concerns? Talk about the new mulligan rule? Oh, just, oh have... right. This is, yeah, this is the first game uh, the Rules Committee made a big decision just today when we're recording it. We probably won't publish this uh, immediately, but um, yeah. What is, what is it, Garrett? So uh, the new mulligan rule is basically the standard mulligan rule, but we get a free extra seven cards if we don't like our first hand. Right? I think it's always kind of been the case. Typically, every store I go to that has the partial Paris lets you 
replace what whichever you cards you get away because uh, i think it's a multiplayer multiplayer rule right right right, right. but specifically uh we don't get to sculpt our hands as much as we did with partial paris and uh that has some uh that has some consequences with our builds because uh we're all playing somewhat combo-ish builds and yeah, uh way too, it's way too few lands right yeah we, we've we've been a little greedy with our land land bases uh, i know i'm, I'm playing uh Five colors and 36 lands. Uh, <laughs> well, it's like they, they announced this rules change this morning, um, and we knew that we were recording this tonight, and then we went about our days and didn't have time necessarily to change the deck accordingly. So yeah, I think that all of us would like to up our land count a little bit, but we yeah. haven't done that. We'll see how it shakes down. Um, so the, the mulligan rule is different. Mm -hmm. um, Prophet of Krufix is banned, which is only relevant to Tau's five-color deck. But, but then... Prophet wasn't in my deck in the first place. <laughs> God bless you, Tau. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the, the other rule... The mana rule. Oh, so the mana rule, right, right. We can make any color mana now. Cool, so I can make some blue with... Uh, so th that one doesn't affect Tau's deck, <laughs> but in my Zada, mono red, if I ever, for whatever reason, gain control of an opponent's permanent that has another color in it, and I happen to have... I don't even know if I have... Zealous Conscripts. I mean, come on. You can steal something. So. Oh, that's absolutely right. And I could also... I do have you some can... mana dorks that tap for any color. I have right. Opaline Unicorn, for example, as weird as that is. Uh, so, cool. Let's, let's play it. Magic, guys. Let's All do right. It. Well, audience, we will see you in 20 minutes to four hours, depending on the sort of game that we wind up having. <laughs> well, that was interesting. Yeah. I would love to play Magic with you guys sometime, <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, not to yeah. spoil too much, but who went first? Tao went first, right? I went first, yep. So let's just start in turn order then, and uh, what, was, what was your opening hand? What were your thoughts right out of the gate? What were, start at the very beginning. So I ended up keeping my opening seven, um, but I did have some reservations about it. So my opening seven, I had a Sun Titan, a Living Death, a Solemn Simulacrum, a Fleshback Marauder, a Murphic Looter, and two lands, a Polluted Delta, and a Breeding Pool. So so what were your reservations, just that you had two lands? Or did you uh, feel... Because you said you were on, what, 35, 36, 34? Uh, 36 lands, okay. all 10 fetches. So right away from Polluted Delta and Breeding Pool, I know I'm going to have the four primary colors. Right. But I have a 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 curve, which means that uh, if I don't hit that third land, I'm, I'm stuck on just my turn two play. Right. Yeah, but your, your looter also can get you closer to it, right? Yeah, so, so I kept it because the, the looter can help me uh, smooth out my draws. Right. And it has the signature card of the deck, which is Living Death. Um, yes. <laughs> the, the, the curve is a little high. I, I, uh, you know, Sun Titan is the only six drop uh, right. in the entire deck. Well, and it, I kept the converted mana cost on average is about three. And if I remember correctly, you did wind up discarding the Sun Titan relatively early. Right. Like, usually, like, turn three, I think, you Merfolk yeah. looted it away. But yeah. I uh, think the Merfolk looter is the number one reason why I kept. The, a very close second is actually the Fleshbag Marauder. Um, because... My enchantresses, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I know about Garrett's deck. Right. And uh, his, his deck is heavily reliant on enchantresses. And it's... Uh, when he brings out the uh, the Shroud Enchantress, the Argothian Enchantress, it's really hard to interact. Right. And Fleshbag Marauder is a great way to kind of pick that off right away. And, so. and you're thinking he normally has one creature out and then a bunch of enchantments and nothing right. else. Or, or, and also, I guess you could probably recur the Fleshbag Marauder if you needed to. If I found some way to do that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, do you ever worry with fetch lands when you're running a low land count that... Fetching right away, yes, it thins out your deck, but if you're not hitting your land drops, thinning out is actually kind of a bad thing, right? So if a, a two-land hand with one of them is a fetch land in a deck that runs, what did you say, 35? 36. 36? Like, does does that make you nervous at all? Ever? That's what made me nervous. Like, yeah. Merfolk Looter is a great card. I, I love looting effects, even in Commander. Uh, but yeah, there's that, uh, there's that fear that uh, I'm going to be stuck turn three and turn four looting for lands... And not being able to play the spells in my hand. I mean, but it is multiplayer though, so he draws in his opening turn, mm -hmm. so he does get three draws at a land before turn three. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's you know. No, I I think I agree with the keep for sure. Yeah. It, it seems like a very strong hand. Yeah. Um, uh, so for my opening hand, I went second. Um, I had an empty the Warrens, an Ember Cool's Hatcher, a Battle Hymn, a Flare, a Thought Vessel, and two Mountains. And my thoughts right out of the gate were I, I was never more confident than I was when I had my opening hand. My opening hand was pretty great, actually. Um, I was thinking, who needs the partial Paris when you have something like this? The only thing that made me nervous is I only had two mountains, but the thought vessel, the mana rock, 
uh, that was a two drop <laughs> said to me, well, okay, at least I'm going to be able to hit my three drops. And as long as it's uh, our fourth land, I thought that we were going to be um, pretty set because Battle Him is uh, for one colorless and a red, an instant that says add red to your mana pool for each creature you control. And with Emrakul's Hatcher and Empty the Warrens, I had lots of ways to make lots of creatures, and I was thinking, uh, I'm going to do that and have a super explosive turn by casting um, Battle Him and then Flare. Uh, deal one damage to each of my creatures, draw a card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep for each creature that I controlled. I thought that I, My whole game plan was in my opening hand, so I felt very good, except I knew I needed Mountains. So I, I wasn't going to get the Scry 1, which hurt. It couldn't partial anything away. Uh, but I'll take that hand... Any game. Uh, yeah, 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 that's yeah. really it. That's really it. Well, right. it really sounds like you needed <laughs> just that fifth mana to hit, right? To, to hit the Everquill's Hatcher. Well, in an ideal world, I would have partialed that away, right? right. But I thought that the battle him alone was probably enough. Even when things started slipping out of my control in that game, um, my thought was, well, if I get lucky, I can still dump a lot of creatures somehow and battle him into everything else right. in my hand. Um, yeah. But... Not to spoil too much. <laughs> it's not how I was like, right? yeah. <laughs> So, uh, but I really didn't like my first opening, my opening hand. Um, I had a Sterling Grove, uh, a Replenish, and a Holistic Wisdom, which are which are all great cards, but they don't really do anything in my deck. And then I had a. Uh, well, they, they don't do anything in a vacuum. In, on in their a own. vacuum, exactly. Right. So you, they, you, they just kind of they sit do in lots hand. of things in your deck. Yes. <laughs> so they, at the beginning, though, when I'm sitting here and I'm like, all I want are these low drops. I'm like, okay, so I have three cards that need other things to work. And then I had two forests, a Sarah Sanctum, which didn't tap for mana, and a Verdant Catacombs. Um, so so, you're saying, so well, it's, it's, Sarah Sanctum is the one that taps for uh, white mana for every enchantment you control. Which is a great card. Uh, yeah, eventually it gets you Eventually. Yeah, yeah. So, but I'm looking at the hand and I'm like, I'm not very happy with it just because I want an explosive start because I know how you both of your decks go. Right. But I, I just kept it because I saw four lands and I was kind of like, this will do. With the new mulligan system, yeah. I think more and more you're going to see people saying, well, I got four lands, so yeah. Yeah. this will do. <laughs> exactly. So that, that's what I started out with. On my first turn, though, one thing that I did, uh, I, I did make a mistake. Um, what my, my first turn thought was, I drew a wild growth. And I said, okay. And wild growth is for a green. For, I, can, I can enchant a land. And, and it taps for an for, additional green. It taps for an additional green, exactly. Right. So I drew the wild growth and I, said, I had it in my hand and I'm like, I'm not going to play this because I don't have an enchantress out yet. And I don't need the ramp necessarily. So I kept it in my hand. You thought and you'd get more value Exactly, with, when I got an Enchantress out. And, I, with had the cantrip, the, and yeah. I had the Sterling Grove in my hand, so I figured I'm just going to get an Enchantress with the Sterling Grove, and then, I will, um, then I'll play the, the Wild Growth. But um, what ended up happening was uh, my Wild Growth kind of sat in my hand for a, a good amount of time, and I didn't actually get to cantrip with it at, at the pace I would like to, where I could have uh, played it the first turn, and then I could have got my Sterling Grove, sacked it my second turn, and then I would have had an Enchantress plus another enchantment So you're saying third if, turn. if you so had foregone the cantrip idea, exactly. you would have been able to actually start cantripping much exactly. sooner. Exactly. It's all over my notes. Should have played, the, should have played it earlier. Should have played it earlier. <laughs> turn, turn below. Turn two turns back. Like It was just like constant, but whatever. No one got off to a crazy explosive start. We weren't seeing, you know, Soul Ring, Mana Crypt, turn three, Kozilek, right? But um, I maybe ramped... The best in the first couple of turns. Oddly enough, yeah. Well, just with the thought vessel. Very simple. Right. Opening hand, turn two, drop that, which put me on pace for a turn three Zada. And I actually made a note here when I cast Zada. I said, risky. <laughs> and, and my thought was um, that if the board managed to be wiped by Garrett, I was worrying about the green-white deck casting a Wrath of God on curve on turn four, you know, wiping. I think you had a few looters out, a few mana dorks. Um, so I thought the threat was Garrett. <laughs> I said, if board is wiped by Garrett, could be in a little trouble. Feeling okay about it because of battle him plus creatures still in hand. Uh, so that, that was my what, what I was thinking. So I started turn four, um, and I already had a... Uh, I played a Sylvan Carry added on turn three. So I was going to turn four with five mana. And I kind of had a decision to make here about whether to uh, keep ramping with the Solemn. Or I could pick off Dan your Zada right away with a Fleshbag Marauder. Yeah. Now, I kept that Fleshbag Marauder in order to nab Garrett's first Enchantress. But it was funny because the way that I got my Enchantress was I actually got an Enchantress's Presence, which is an enchantment which couldn't be hit by the flash, Fleshbag Marauder. So right. I kind of got lucky there. It wasn't like my yeah. plan to, to play around the Fleshbag right. Marauder. And that Sterling but... Grove was on uh, that Sterling Grove was on the battlefield at the time. Right. So if I knew your deck a little better. 
it would have been a snap decision. Uh, the decision I made would have been made even quicker because right, right. I would have known. But I did pause there in thinking about should I try to hold a Fleshbag Marauder and get a little greedy, try to get Zada and an Enchantress at the same time. But then I figured uh, I had a two drop and a Fleshbag Marauder, so that uses all five of my mana. I bet that if I passed a turn to you, Dan, uh, the Marauder wouldn't have been good to to grab Zada anymore. <laughs> you would have played some other thing, uh, like some goblin tokens, and then... It, uh... Well, and with Zada, often we're just looking for value once, right? If mm -hmm. I have many tokens and a way to draw a card for each creature I control, often that's enough to refill my hand to the point where I know what my mm -hmm. late game strategy is. Right. You, you effectively shut down any hope that I had for <laughs> a late game right then and there, because you made Zada cast six and I don't think I ever got to six man. I, <laughs> I, I, I did make a note. Turn four, Tau is dropping lots of cantrip slash looty dorks is what I called them. <laughs> Merfolk looters. And it seems to be on plan. And yeah, we sacked so, out a damn. Actually, uh, I have a quick question. Um, do you want the Fleshbag Marauder in your graveyard? Because I like you had um, the Wall of Blossoms and you had a Wall of Blossoms in play and you could have sacked it and started like s attacking with it is what I was thinking you were going to do. I mean, just getting for a couple quick shots, have an extra blocker, but you you sacked... Uh, yeah, generally uh, I want the like Fleshbag Marauder and Merciless Executioners also in the deck. I want them in the graveyard because that's where they're going to get more value and uh, actually got some value mm -hmm. In, yeah. a, in a couple of yeah. turns from that, too. My turn four is about where things started to fall apart. I was really <laughs> needing to draw a mountain. I got lucky. Turn yeah. three, I did draw a mountain, which allowed right. me to cast Zada on curve without my opponents realizing that I was top decking my lands. Yeah. Uh, uh, instead, I drew a Tempt with Vengeance. Um, and so I had a very minor choice. Do I cast this and try to get some elementals? Um, or do I cast the Young Pyromancer, which I drew on turn two? Um, I cast the Young Pyromancer and put in parentheses uh, what we should have done last turn. <laughs> uh, I, I could have played a little bit more conservatively and left Zada in the command zone, only costing four mana so that we might have had a chance to uh, explode and get immediate value from her. Because like right. I said, we only need value once. Um, now th that's interesting because your turn four, you know you did not hit your next... That, that's when you hit, uh, missed your first land drop. Right, I mean, I missed yeah. a land drop on turn four, but I still had four mana because of the thought vessel. So it okay. wasn't it wasn't yeah. an all is lost moment. It's just a oh shucks. At that so point. did you consider at that time maybe just tempting use all your mana because you you still had that battle him, right? I, I, I did right. So I I thought about it. I thought right. about do I tempt with vengeance or do I cast a young pyromancer? And the reason I went with the pyromancer um, is because there's a chance that if we started hitting our land drops, if we managed to refill our hand, you know, um, that I could tempt on turn 10 for you know 20 elementals and then just win the game outright with it so uh, young pyromancer if you want to start getting value it, it is much more incremental um and i did have a couple instants that i probably wanted to save i mean like the battle hymn for mm -hmm. example that i could have in a pinch fired off to get an extra elemental blocker it, it, it was just a slightly more um I had a little more versatility with that play at that okay. point I, felt. I think that highlights a little difference in our philosophies because i think if i was in your seat I would have wanted to guarantee I get to five, six, five, six, seven mana on my mm -hmm. next turn. Well, so that that's what I did on my next turn. I did yeah. wind up casting the Tempt with Vengeance. But before we get there, I think that Garrett had a pretty explosive turn four. Um, my turn four, my explosive turn four actually wasn't, no, it was turn five that I really started to go off. My turn four, I got an Enchantress Presence into play. And then um, I actually got another Enchantress into play of Viridian, or... Um, yeah, no, I a got Verduran Enchantress? A Verduran Enchantress as well. I had two Enchantresses at this time, and then I believe I, I even cast the Wild Growth I talked about before, which let me draw two cards for one mana. Anytime you can that I was... cast a Divination for one mana. It's, it's not quite an Ancestral Recall, but right. it's, it's certainly <laughs> I, not I didn't get that back in, so no. <laughs> Turn four was also when you dropped Sarah Sancto. Oh, yes, I did drop. But I, and I even have a note in here. I was like, this is a big mistake if they have any land destruction. But I kind of know the play group that we're in because I played against you a bunch of times. And we've kind of swayed away from land destruction. So I, I played it just because I wanted to get further land drops out. I, I did make a note during your turn four. I, I get, maybe it's not explosive, but I wrote, your enchantment engine is coming online. That was the turn where it really felt like, all right, Garrett's not going to be locked out of this game. He's clearly <laughs> going to have as much card draw as he needs, as much mana as he needs. The question in my mind at that point is, sometimes with enchantress enchantment-based decks, 
you get the engine, but you don't get what you need to close it out, right? You have a huge imposing board, but nothing that actually gets you closer to knocking out your opponent. Moving into the mid game, turn five was an interesting turn if your name was not Dan Brown. Uh, I yeah, needed a mountain real bad and I drew uh, a fire cat blitz, which is literally the last card I wanted to see uh, in my hand right there. So it basically became Will, Tao, and Garrett neutralize each other to the point where I might be able to sneak in. I mean, there's always hope with Sada. I had Battle Him in my hand. That was my plan from my opening <laughs> yeah, hand. Definitely. Uh, so there's, a, there's always a chance. But I, I did make a note uh, on turn five that Tao was doing more looting, loading his graveyard with creatures. I even wrote spider spawning question mark question mark i don't know if you want to speak more about what you were doing turn five or maybe turn six turn four i devoted to the fleshbag marauder to get the zada off right. the board so turn five had to be another setup turn for me okay so i ended up playing a satyr wayfinder that had drawn i think on turn two so i got a forest off the satyr wayfinder and the I put, karmic guy in the graveyard at that point, right? No, so, that was actually the next turn. Uh, I, I put a Tortured Existence, a Nyx Weaver, and a Fellow Dark Hub. With the Living Death that I had in my hand since my opening hand, uh, I knew that next turn I would be able to get it back and possibly cut Garrett off of and card draw. On turn five, uh, I started having this idea that on turn six, I was going to Living Death. Not not to combo out, but just like a value Living Death. Right. To slow Garrett down a little bit and develop my board. Because in three-player games, sometimes it's just important to use the things that normally in a bigger game you would sandbag until you can actually close out the whole thing. Just block someone from... Yeah, I think in three-player, you you kind of want to maintain parity as long as possible. Yeah. You can't really let one player get too far ahead. Like I mentioned, I, I had a re Replenish and a uh, Creeping Renaissance. So, I mean, like his putting my stuff into my graveyard actually, you know... I had three chances at recasting all of them. Well, so, right, and in and, and turn five, I, I mentioned this is where I kind of lost hope entirely. You right. did wind up casting... Stony Silence, yeah, Stony, actually. Stony so. Silence, which, I mean, I only had one artifact, but when you only have three, three lands and the mana rock, shutting down the mana rock... <laughs> and on turn six, I draw Demir Houseguard. Usually what I, uh, what I do is I transmute for Sidisi, because like you said, Sidisi is kind of a hidden commander, and I kind of just to make the the fun play is to get the hidden commander out. Yeah. Well, and in a, in a game that you think might last a while, it's mm -hmm. probably just sort of the good value play that sets up some explosive right turn nine, ten. Or My bad, I guess. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Demir Housecard can also transmute for Birthing Pod, which can open up the toolbox uh, that I have in the deck to counter anything that's on the board. Right. So I go into turn six. And I'm going to turn six, and I'm going to have eight mana. My ideal play at this point would be play the Demir House card, don't transmute it, sack my entire board, and Living Death. And then bring back everything. And, and then bring back everything. But that's nine mana. Right. So now my decision is, do I go for a more value turn by you know, transmuting with the Demir House card and playing Sidisi, or do I just Living Death for value because I know Living Death will, uh, like uh, I knew from turn five, would give me back a Felidar Cub. And, and so at this point, just what are, do you know all the creatures that were in your graveyard at this point? Or is yeah, it... the, the most relevant ones, I had the uh, Fleshbag Marauder right. from taking out uh, Zada, yeah. which would have gotten rid of the Verduring Enchantress on Garrett's board. Okay. And I had the Felidar Cub, which would have gotten rid of the Enchantress's presence. Right. So... And how, how many more were there? Were, were there a lot of other creatures in your graveyard at that point? Or was it just like those two and maybe a couple Yeah, others? and then there was... Uh, the more I talk about it, the more wrong this turn seems to be now. <laughs> because... Well, we're learning here, right? Yeah, because I had the Sun Titan, which was looted there from turn turn two. Yeah. And I had just looted again and drawn a Clever Impersonator. Yeah. And dropped the Clever Impersonator into the yard. So I remember making a note when you put the Clever Impersonator in the yard thinking, that was juicy. That's a juicy reaction. And now target. I'm thinking, if I Living Death there, not only do I take care of Garrett's draw for, for one turn, slow him down one turn, but I can also get back some of the, uh, some of the creatures I have to sack anyway because the Sun Titan brings something back, and the Clever Impersonator can enter the battlefield as another Sun Titan, <laughs> bringing back something else. Yeah. Um, I even made a note to myself, I got greedy. I thought, let me just uh, extend my board a, a little bit. I thought next turn would have been a better turn to, to Living Death. So you... And I actually end up casting Sidisi and putting Karmic Guide, Rex Sage, 
and unburial rights into my yard. And that was just luck, right? And that was just luck, I but <laughs> it would have made it it, it would have made a turn seven living death a lot stronger than a turn six living death, with the downside of giving Gary a huge turn with yeah. Sarah Sanctum and yeah. two enchantresses in place. That's right. true. So you, you and this is the, this is the turn that I kind of not one, but I kind of scoped in my hand. I drew ten cards in this turn. Well, um, so 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 Tao's decision was basically. Uh, do I think Garrett is able to win this turn right. or not? And you decided... I decided he wasn't going to be able to win this turn. Yeah. I guess I downplayed in my mind how big a deal it Ten was been, right? to get him to give him a big turn. So, Going forward, I know that one turn with Garrett's deck with two enchantresses in play, if, if he doesn't win that turn, the game's... All but locked up. Anyway. Well, well, so what did you do right, <laughs> with, so, with this turn that Tao so graciously gave you? Uh, I just started casting actual uh, mana, mana doublers for my land. So I, I cast a Market Festival, a Utopia Sprawl, um, and which just kept drawing me more cards. I, I mean, I got a Worldly Tutor off of it. Um, I got Opalescence, Ground Seal. I got, and then I drew seven lands this turn as well. So, uh, like, at this point, like, uh, Dan was mentioning that Enchantress sometimes, like, burn out. Right. And I literally just had a, a handful of lands. Um, now I had four, or I had, I had lands tapping for four to five mana with Market it. Festival's Utopia Sprawls. I, I played a Ground Seal just to draw three cards. But um, And at that point, I think I made a note that uh, the good news is that Tao and Garrett think that each other are the primary <laughs> threats. Yes. <laughs> that was the only bit of good news. And actually, ironically enough, every time I wrote the good news, you, as I was typing that, something would happen that was very clearly the bad news. Uh, and in this case, it was bad news, worldly tutor for Crater Hoof Behemoth. Yes. <laughs> um, I did. And then I even have next to it, I showed too much because at this point, um, Tao, uh, I didn't know he had the living death in his hand from turn one, but this turn, Tao decided to try and wipe the entire board. And I was... Um, that was your turn seven? Was, turn seven, yeah. right. Right, but uh, like it, he was the, the turn right after mine. So like yeah. I ended with putting Crater Hoof into my hand yes. uh, with um, a couple more cards, and I was just like, all right, cool. I'm I'm, I'm pretty set right now. So so yeah, value central turn six yeah. for Garrett, and then Tau's turn seven. Uh, was it everything you hoped and dreamed it might be? Way back when in turn six. <laughs> well, it was. I mean, I, I I was a little I was a little taken aback by Garrett's turn, and right. at this point, I'm thinking. I'm one turn too slow. I wrote that Tau had been weakened by Garrett because of the ground seal, and you O-ringed one of yeah, these things, uh, too. Yeah, a Sidisi I O-ringed. Right, right. So your, your value generators had, mm -hmm. um, your Sidisi anyway, had uh, been shut down. And, and in my mind, I wasn't thinking about living death. I was just thinking, well, good, he can't unburial rights back his karmic guide for his sun titan, for his whatever, you know. But uh, he still did it. <laughs> right, so at this point, um, I have no reason not to cast the living death it's not going to be a, a winning living death because even though i have the sack outlet in the graveyard in the demir house guard um i don't have a loop between all of the creatures that can cycle themselves and i also don't have a, a blood artist type card right now to kind of do any damage to anybody right. so it was going to be a value living death um i got a lot of value out of it and i you know Got the Enchantress's presence off the board. Uh, the extra Rex Sage actually got uh, allowed me to kill another enchantment, um, and uh, the Fleshback Marauder got the Verdurian Enchantress. So at the end of the turn, I, I think I cast Living Death, and there's something like ten different triggers on um, at once. All resolved, got a lot of value, refilled my hand. I thought I was in a pretty good position at turn six. It's actually funny because on your turn uh, six or seven, um, you asked me, can you take care of Tao's board? I did ask that, <laughs> and, and that changed my play. Knowing that you felt confident about dealing with Tao, it changed my decision making a little. Not that my decisions were nearly as complex or important to the outcome as yours at that point. So I actually had a last gasp of hope. Uh, it didn't last very long, but in response to your living death, I still had my young pyromancer on the battlefield, right. and I had a flare in my hand, which is one of these weird cards that, you know, building around Zada forces you to, like, seek out. I cast flare, targeting my young pyromancer, killing it so that it would come back with the living death, and I would draw two cards during the beginning of my next turn rather than one to hopefully maybe before one of my opponents won uh be able to again flood the board with creatures and generate a bunch of mana with battle him and maybe find some way to combo it, it 
didn't work because I, I neglected to realize that you were bringing back your flesh bag marauder right. with the living death, which immediately killed my young pyromancer at any chance that I had <laughs> at uh, flooding the board with creatures. But I at least got an extra draw, which happened to be a firestorm, which mm-hmm. again gave me another kind of last gasp of maybe a little bit of hope of dealing with you, Garrett, on right. turn seven. Uh, which is... walk, walk, us, walk us through your turn seven. Yeah. All right, so uh, my turn seven is the turn I won. Um, so Spoiler this, alert. Yeah, I mean, it, the game was <laughs> over at this point. And I, and, and I, kind, of under, I, I kind of knew it was over because uh, um, I had the uh, Replenish in my hands. I had the... Um, uh, which which we call it? Um, I had the creeping renaissance in the graveyard because I had cast it earlier, so I, I had like several times that I could just reanimate reanimate myself. Um, and I also had Sterling Grove, so I had this like tutor effect for any enchantment that I wanted. And you had plenty of ways to recur it, so you could basically tutor for an enchantment, put it on top, cast another enchantment, draw it, recur your Sterling Grove, and do it all over again. Exactly. So you you could fetch any combo you wanted in your right. deck. Uh, right. So uh, that that was the way that I was going to go about it. And what I was looking for is I had the crater from my hand from before. So what I was going to do is I was going to play Opalescence in Parallax Wave, and I was going to blink the Crater of Behemoth a bunch of times, basically making my creatures infinite infinites, and then swing and kill people. So uh, walk me through the combo okay. a little more gradually. Okay. <laughs> I, I apologize, I went a little bit faster. Well, not for so, me, for, for them. Right. For, um, I'm gesturing to the audio recorder right now. Um, so uh, Opalescence makes all of my enchantments creatures, Yes. Uh, including Parallax Wave, which is another enchantment. Right. Um, and Parallax Wa- Wave is like a really weird card. It's got fading, so it kind of like disappears. Um, but um, it, it starts with five fading counters, uh, which uh, and you lose one at the beginning one beginning of each one of your upkeeps. Not that that's really it's, relevant. It's never going to happen. Um, actually, it, it has happened. I won't say that. Sure. But, but um, it, not in this game. Not in exactly. this Exactly. Uh, we're not going to last five more turns. Um, <laughs> since it's a creature, um, its other ability is I can remove a fading counter to exile something, um, including itself, because it, or exile a creature but now including itself because it's a creature. So, and that's only until fa- uh, Parallax it Wave leaves play. leaves play and then it comes back. Right. So, so it's so, old O-ring wording. Right. Type. If you do it to itself, it immediately comes back as per its own clause. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So it kind of just blinks itself, um, but I can I can sneak under the Crater of Behemoth underneath it and then blink it. So when it leaves play, the Crater of Behemoth comes back and right. it comes back. Because you have five fate encounters to right. work with. So the first exactly. one goes to Crater Hoof. Then the second one goes to itself. Yes. They both come back, yeah. blink infinite times. I exactly. did have one try. I had one try at dealing with your board. Had I really thought about it? Had I looked at your graveyard carefully before this? So um, I, it wouldn't. I would have known that it wouldn't have mattered, and it probably wouldn't have mattered anyway because <laughs> you had all the cards in the world in your hand and all the mana right. that you could ever want. But my try was Firestorm. I discarded four cards with it. I was able to target four of your enchantments because they were creatures now because they were creatures with yep. your opalescence but uh it, it, it didn't matter because you what, what's the card that you had oh, flashback so i had um the creeping renaissance had flashback right but i also had an earthcraft out at this point as well so i could tap my now enchantment creatures to untap my lands they're tapping for five mana and make a ton of mana you, yeah you <laughs> you had it by about a hundred different angles yeah. at this point yeah i stopped i stopped taking notes he drops crater hoof that's that's, yeah. how, that's how it happens folks Oh, but it was it was a great game. Um, well, I mean, like, if you like played I, more. If you played more, it'd been a great game. I was gonna, like I said at the beginning, sometime we should play Magic together. Right? <laughs> I, I would love to play a game of Magic with you guys sometime. <laughs> this is very much a, a race type game. None right. of us were playing particularly interactive decks. No one was on the control, and we we kind of did that deliberately because we knew we were going to do a podcast about it, and we didn't want the game to last forever because mm-hmm. the more turns you have to talk about. The larger the file is that I have to import to the computer, the more I have to... Edit. Anyway, so... Um, I mean, it's it wasn't a game with big interactions. Like, we're not playing a lot of rats. We're not playing a lot of targeted removal. But, you know, our, our decks do affect each other, right? Yes. Like, the Fleshback Marauder was big, that game, in just cutting... Zada off yeah. right away. Well, I, I mean, I, I also kind of messed you up with the uh, Stony Silence, too. I mean, like... But... It wasn't a non-interactive game, I guess. Maybe maybe I misspoke. But the interactions happened mainly at sorcery speed. Mainly right. on our own turns. Right. So, um, you know, there, there, there was no sneaking in, responding. There, there weren't a right. whole lot of stack interactions but happening. Also, I would say, like, my deck and Garrett's deck are built extremely along one axis. Yes. Like... Um, very, very linear builds, if you will. I'm my deck is all about the graveyard. Uh, Garrett's deck is all about enchantments, and um, 
those are strategies that if you have the right cards, you can shut them down very right? quickly. Yeah, yeah, because I might have said this, but on my uh, on the turn that I didn't living death, you know, I, I I wrote down a note. If Garrett plays rest in peace, I don't even know if rest in peace is in his deck. But if he plays rest in peace, I'm screwed. Yeah, oh, because I'm locked out of the game at, at this point. Like the Felidar Cub is sitting in my <laughs> graveyard, yeah. um, and I now need to top deck another answer. Right. If my deck had something like Bane of Progress, and I was able to hit Bane of <laughs> Progress <laughs> at the right time, over. then his game is, is over. So uh, it, we have strategies that it's hard to deal with unless you have these like global destruction effects. Because right. we've gone so far down this one path. That just the one for one removal, like a Felidar Cub here, a Reclamation Sage here, is not going to slow down Garrett's deck enough. Right. And like, even the Ground Seal isn't enough to slow me down because there's so many different ways I can get back creatures from the graveyard. Right. Well, and, and in a three player game, you can't take for granted that, for example, the board will be reset at some point. You know, in a five, six player game, someone's going to Psych Crypt at some point or someone's going to Wrath of God at some point. But here, it really was just kind of a foot race. Yeah. And. Garrett just flashed me the rest in peace that's in a different color sleeve because it's not <laughs> in his main deck. <laughs> <laughs> Sideboard, it's in quotations. I mean, we don't have those, but yeah. This is this is your maybe board? Yeah, exactly. I've got like 30 cards over there, just uh, <laughs> all random enchantments. Yeah, Nevermore, we got a privileged position. It's pretty good stuff. So let's go in turn order once again, starting with Tau. Um, lessons that we learned from this game. Uh, go. Uh, I think my biggest lesson is... Uh, don't give Garrett a big turn. Uh, but I, I, I think that's a, there's a more general lesson there too, which is uh, I had, especially in a three-player game, I had the ability to get a little ahead and stop an opponent from getting way ahead. Right. So, and I should have taken it instead of thinking, let me be greedy and wait one more turn so I can get even further ahead as long as something bad doesn't happen. <laughs> if you're not going to win immediately... You need to think about how do I slow down my opponents in a three-player game, because uh, one trip around the table is a long time, and a sure. lot can happen, especially with two enchantresses on the board. Um, the lesson that I learned, I learned a couple. One is the, the most obvious one is I should put a few more lands in Zada, uh, and two. Moreover, uh, this is a lesson Zada has tried to teach me a few times, and maybe I'll take it to heart one of these days. But sandbag cast in Zada. Um, for a few turns until I know that I can get immediate value from her value that very same turn. Um, and Garrett, I don't know if you learned any lessons or just want to, you know, dance around the table a little yeah. bit. But I'll, I'll take my dance. All right, I can take right. my, my victory lap. And I mean, just the more enchantresses, the better. I mean, I could have, I wouldn't have been able to draw <laughs> ten cards if I didn't have two enchantresses in play. Are there more so, enchantresses you could run, or do you yeah, have them all? I know I had they're all in there, That's but I mean, I'm more, maybe more tutors or something for enchantresses. <laughs> I, I don't know, but like, well, great. Thank you guys very much for listening. And if you have an idea as to what we should call this for future episodes, leave a comment below. I'm not going to say highest comment wins, but the comment I like the most will win. Okay. Okay. All I right. like it. I like it. I, I'm going to put my comments in. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go to bed. I'm, I'm, losing, I'm losing my ability to speak coherently because I've been talking about magic for like an hour and a half now. But, okay, bye.